Right, good morning, colleagues, uh, and welcome to the 13th meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. We have apologies from Neil Bibby. Uh, as usual, can I just ask you to put your mobile phones in a mode that won't interfere with proceedings? Um, the first item on our agenda today is to decide whether to take item three in private. Are members agreed? Agreed. We agree to take my, my, um, item three in private. Thank you. The second item on agenda is to take evidence as part of a Scottish approach to taxation. We are joined today by Judith Robertson, the chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Sandra Eden, who is a senior lecturer at Edinburgh, Uni the University of Edinburgh, and Susanna Simpson, who is the head of private business at Waterhouse Coopers LLP. I, I welcome you to our evidence session this morning. We have received written submissions, which have been useful from all, all three of you. Um, the particular focus of this inquiry is in, in ten corporations, but there are obviously general issues that we we'll want to explore as well, particularly around human rights, and I'm glad to have Judith Robertson here for that purpose. Uh, can I just bore down, and I'm sorry to get straight into the numbers, but I found it very interesting in Sandra Eden's um, submission, um, drawing out again the, the, the figure from the OBR about a potential drop in tax revenue of £3.5 billion by 2021. Um, as a result of incorporations, and the number, because the number is increasing. It's Sandra and, or, or anybody else that wants to, can, it's always difficult to extrapolate from that sort of number what the impact would be for Scotland. Normally we would apply something about 10%, but I'm not sure that's applicable in these circumstances. But could you have a best go, perhaps, at uh, explaining what that might mean for Scottish tax revenues, um, given that that's, you know, that's quite a, if it was 10%, it, it would be, you know, Three hundred and fifty million pounds potentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the, the the estimated loss um, of tax and national insurance was um, just over six billion, and that was made up from the UK perspective by an increase in corporate tax revenue. So that's that's where the the, the loss of three billion comes from. So you you, you lose six million, so six billion, and you gain three billion from inc increased corporation tax revenues. Obviously, this, this plays out differently in Scotland. So I did a kind of back of, obviously, back of an envelope uh, calculation, but I assumed that, um, and, and the, this, this could be not particular, you know, this is real back of the envelope sort of assumptions, but um, I assumed that if the six billion loss was half tax and half national insurance contributions, and we, we don't know that, it's quite a difficult thing to do, but let's say it's half tax and half national insurance contributions. Obviously, Scotland isn't losing the national insurance contribution revenue, so they're only losing half of the scaled-down amount of six billion. And so assuming that they're losing half and assuming a sort of population relative, relativity of 8% um, of, of the UK, um, I estimated that it could potentially lead to, to a loss of um, 240 million by 2021. Now, subsequent to me doing this, this sort of scribble at the back of the envelope, I have actually seen figures from um, from elsewhere. I forget where at the moment, but which which suggested um, in the region of of 200 million. So it's not that far off. So those are the sorts of figures that you could potentially be be looking at. Okay, it's a sizable sum, obviously, and, and I'm grateful for you doing that, as you describe it, back of the envelope type of work. Do you think, that, are, are you any, have you any feeling about whether, if this committee was to ask HMRC, for instance, or the Treasury, to, 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 to create an estimate for Scotland in that, in the same way as you've done, but in a, and obviously a, in a more defined way, because they've got all the numbers behind them, do you think they'd be able to do that for us? <coughs> I've no idea. It, it would only be with a, a quite high degree of uncertainty. Um, I mean, all these things are because um, the, the in, in corporations are growing more sc slowly in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. So that, that would have an impact. That might reduce the numbers um, a little bit. Um, I, I, I have no idea whether HMRC would be able to do that or not. So. Okay. Does anybody else want to reflect on, on that at this stage? To say, I suppose, I think that reflects um, there are so there are a huge number of factors involved in the decision as to whether incorporate or whether to incorporate or not. Um, 
not just tax, but also, which is obviously my area, but, but commercial as well. And I think that's what makes it, I would agree with you, I think it makes it so difficult to be able to predict the impact of this going forwards. OK, well, well obviously, so, some of the things that might impact in it are behavioural changes and behavioural impacts. And I think Murdo wanted to pick up on that issue. So, Murdo, would you? Uh, yes, thank you, Convener. Um, good morning uh, to you all. Um, what, one of the things I think that's of interest to the committee is whether the the rate of incorporation might be different in Scotland compared to the UK as a whole if it were driven by different factors, for example, differentials in terms of income tax. Now, we've seen the Scottish Government introduce an income tax differential for higher earners, um, which will have, a, have an impact, albeit a relatively modest impact, but an impact nonetheless. To what extent do you think differential taxation in Scotland used by the devolved government is likely to drive more people in Scotland towards incorporation compared to the rest of the United Kingdom, or is it is that unlikely to be a major factor? Maybe you could start with yourself, Susanna Simpson. So I think it depends on um, where on the not clearly on the on the level of differential um, introduced and at what rates. So it may be with the number of forty percent tax payers in Scotland um, more people will be impacted if the change was at that rate, but equally if the change was at the additional rate, it would be a higher quantum, um, but less taxpayers affected. So mobility is clearly the, the key underlying driver in terms of income tax, because taxpayers can vote with their feet and move. Um, so it therefore depends on whether um, any such changes more impact more numbers of um, taxpayers rather than, than those who are, who are higher earners. I think um, from a behavioural perspective, the key thing to remember here is that um, taxpayers have more confidence and therefore let their behaviours be affected less if they know where the policy is going, why changes are, are introduced, how they're implemented and ultimately the impact felt. So there's some empirical evidence as to you know, benefits to the economy as a result of tax changes and therefore I think taxpayers are less likely to take behavioural decisions um, based, on, based on changes. That's my view. Okay, thank you. I, again, I looked at the OBR f figures and a, a point which I didn't make particularly clearly in the paper, but was was that there's there's always been um, primarily a NIC differential between being incorporated and not incorporated, and that has increased gradually, but not dramatically. So it's increasing a little bit faster, but it's it's a sort of steady um, move up the way, except for two particular tax-driven periods. One was the very sm the, the, the zero rate on um, very small companies. Um, and you can see an enormous spike in incorporations at that point. And then the other is was, was a preemptive move that didn't work when the, when the thoughts and warranty avoidance rules was, was, was coming in for um, the, people who are really self-employed, but so really employed, but working self-employed. So you, you, you see those spikes, but those are both dramatic, potentially dramatic changes. So my feeling is that the, the tax-driven response is unlikely to be dramatic, um, except at significant levels of change. Now, you're going to say, well, what's significant? I have no idea. Um, but, you know, Two or three or four, or I, I don't know, what would you feel, 5% even possibly? I think those probably wouldn't be enough to stimulate people into incorporating, unless they're going to incorporate pretty much anyway. Well, actually, to give you a very, a very current example, I mean, there is speculation in today's papers around the reinstatement of the 50% rate for additional taxpayers. If, if the Scottish Government, which has the power to do this, were to increase the additional rate from 45 pence to 50 pence. Do you think that would be significant? Would that drive higher earners towards incorporation? I would need to see the evidence of the rate of tax paid by people who are in these, the position where you can incorporate or not. I mean, it's, it's, you know, but, people who are earning a lot of money might be in the position where they're in, in, in companies which they'd, they'd be in um, a company anyway. The, the, 
I don't know. Do you have any feeling about the micro, uh, not the micro companies, but the, the sort of the sorts of companies that we're talking about who would mm -hmm. be making that decision? It, they may not be the additional rate taxpayers. They may be more likely to be the basic and high rate taxpayers. I don't know. Back to my point that if that changes at the higher, the additional rate end, there will be less taxpayers impacted, and they may well be the owners of the larger, the larger businesses. But that's speculation, so it depends on on you know how much that's going to play through, yeah. and I mean, I, I, they will be the more of, mobile ones. So, a lot yeah. of those would probably be already be, be companies anyway, mm. um, but I, I don't know that. That's that's a speculation. Okay. Okay. Marie, oh, sorry, sorry, Ivan, did you have a supplementary on that? Did you? Yeah, I was going Sorry, to come in on, on that and, and just explore well, both of the points. I actually explore it a wee bit, a wee bit further. Um, is there a? Um, we're talking as if people have got this choice, and you wake up in the morning and decide to incorporate, not incorporate. But of course, it's it's more complicated than that, and there are rules around about that because clearly some work should be employed, and other clearly is something that requires to be done through incorporation. Um, so I just want to explore that a wee bit further. And, and understand your view on the rules around about that, which obviously over time have been tightened up um, with IR35 and other, other steps that are continuing to be taken um, to, to make it clearer which side of that fence you should be on. Um, do you think that the, the rules there are, are clear enough or do you think the enforcement of them isn't robust enough? Because if they were clear and they were robust, we shouldn't really be having this conversation because people really shouldn't have that choice. It should be a matter of fact whether you're incorporated or not. Um, now, there are some grey areas, but I mean, do you want to maybe just talk round about, round about that? Um, I'll take that one for, <laughs> for starters. Um, I think uh, it comes back to the point that there's a number of factors in whether you incorporate or not. It's, it's your point around what the drivers are um, on that event. So my clients, for instance, that are startups or scale-up um, businesses, so um, the sort of true high-growth ones driving a lot of the economy up in, in Scotland, will quite often take the decision to incorporate because it limits their liability. It allows them to roll up profits and invest at the beginning of that, uh, of that journey. Um, which can't necessarily be achieved using non-incorporated um, structures. So, uh, so I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that those are some very, very good reasons to incorporate roll up a profits differential in being able to decide when to distribute and bring stakeholders in um, or out. Uh, I think there is a bit of work being done over the summer um, uh, through the UK government and Matthew Taylor's leaving, leading a project to look at the drivers on self-employment versus employment and how that plays out into the in, into incorporations and it'll be interesting to see the results of that and um, to see what drivers they believe they are, there are non-commercial drivers I suppose um, in making that decision but uh, yeah in my experience tax is one of the factors but it's only one of the factors taken into account particularly on those sort of high growth SMEs. Yeah sorry. Well, I mean, yeah. my, my, my feeling is, is that the rules are terribly vague. Um, you, you're talking about a continuum, and the borderlines on continuums are always difficult to apply. But, I mean, I, I was just thinking that one of the things that has, has really sharpened up in the UK tax system recently was the definition of um, residence for human beings, which used to be absolutely ghastly, didn't it? It was really vague, and HMRC guidance wasn't very helpful. Um, and the, the new statutory residence test has is, is much more precise. I mean, clearly, residence is a, is a continuum, but now it's much more precise, and, and the factors which have to be taken into account and how many factors you have to satisfy. Now, I, I, I haven't done the work here, but I would suspect that you could probably tighten up on that um, borderline. But it's, it, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult thing for HMRC to do, because... That there are probably a lot of people on that borderline. It requires resources to um, to keep an eye on it. Yeah. I, mean, I suppose I, mean, I take the point, Susanna, about if you're a start-up business, that's, that's one thing, but I'm thinking more of the scenario which, in the kind of the back of our minds, is driving the, the rise in corporations, which I'm working for a company and I don't like paying tax, so I'll set up my own company and then sell my services back to this other company through my company and that has been driven by employees doing it, it's been driven by companies 
persuading employees to do it, and not just at the high end, but at the bottom end as well, through the gig economy. Now, that's clearly not following the, the spirit of the of the rules, um, whether the, the legality allows it with, with some grey areas. And that's a very, very different thing from somebody who says to start up a high growth business to, 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 to invest in something. It's a very, very different scenario. So I'm more focused on, on that, because at the end of the day, the conversation we're having is round about is that what's driving in corporations and driving this tax, three billion tax gap you talked about. It's not people starting up high tech, innovative businesses, it's people that are um, making the shift from employment to self-employment or incorporation because, but not actually changing what they're doing. Um, and, and that's the area I'm kind of trying to focus down on. So what you're saying is that the rules are, could be clearer and the enforcement could be yeah, could be have more resource I, I behind would, it. I would say so. That, that you know the courts are, are developing rules as as we go along. Uh, but so, sometimes you you're better actually taking another approach and let, let, letting the courts sort of burble on and you know uh, they're doing a, a a good good job probably against the rather vague concept. But statute could make you know could could create a, a set of factors. Okay. Um, in terms of certainty, I think, you know, if, if there is more exactly around the residence test, if there's more certainty as to how the rules apply, the, the grey area between what is employment and self-employment taxpayers, it's not very easy for taxpayers to work that out themselves as to whether they're self-employed or employed. So more certainty in that area would always be a good and, thing. And, and taxpayers can exploit uncertainty uh, against the potentially under-resourced HMRC. OK, thanks. Right, Marie? Um, can I take you back to the issue of um, behavioural change with regard to changes in taxation? So, um, Marie, uh, sorry, do you pull your microphone down a bit? Just, yeah. Sorry. I'll take you back to the issue of behavioural change around um, changes in taxation. Um, we discussed there that the potential for behaviour change around uh, differences in income tax but has there been any impact on the level of, I know it's too soon maybe to say, but would you speculate, speculate if there's likely to be any impact on the level of incorporation with the changes in, um, say, dividend tax or the speculation around the... I know that there was the UK government was forced to U-turn over national insurance really recently um, and they're refusing to give an assurance that that won't be changed after this general election. Does that change behaviour? in terms of level of um, incorporation and how people set up their companies? Yeah, clearly, a tax being one factor in that decision, things like the changes in the dividend tax rate and, and the proposals and then the withdrawal of the proposals on national insurance contributions will have decreased the strength of that factor in, in making that decision. Um, but I think certainly from my client base, what we've seen developing over the last few years um, is less... Um, people applying the law in a way that clearly wasn't intended um, and they, they are now in the minority I think you're seeking seeking to do that there's been so much in the media around paying the right amount of tax um, and I think you know, the public are reacting to that um, so I think the commercial factors, the world is a very, very complex place to do business now internationally and, um, and domestically. And I think there are so many factors to get through in terms of that. Yes, tax plays a, plays a part in it and, and, and levers um, such as dividend and, and, next, and national insurance contributions changes do have an impact. But I think they're, they're kind of levelled out across the playing field of, of other commercial factors. I wonder, though, just picking up on something that you said earlier, which was that there's clear evidence that... Um people are more likely to try to avoid tax if there isn't clear signalling of policy and where it's going. Does that apply to this type of chopping and changing as well? I presume so. It, just to be clear, I don't think I was saying that there's more evidence that people will avoid tax. I think it's just that um, from a behavioural perspective, if taxpayers can see a clear objective um, and transparency as to how things are implemented and the impact of what they're doing, they're less likely to change their behaviours you know, to take, take, play more part in, the, in developing the economy generally um, as a result of tax changes. Thank you. Anyone else have any thoughts on I, I mean, I... I, I, I think the, the, the move to reduce the exemption on dividends from 5,000 to 2,000 was a, a, a sensible move. I um, don't really see the reason to have a full exemption. Um, I suspect it's at the margins. 
at, at certainly two thousand pounds, it's 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 not that much money. It's a flat sum rather than a, a percentage which increases with your in, income increases. Okay, thank you. The, the other thing I wanted to ask your thoughts on is just um, a very general question. So clearly, income tax was never fully devolved to Scotland. It's quite limited the control that the Scottish government has over income tax, and it's very important as this discussion and previous uh, discussions in this committee have showed that you have a balance between income tax and corporation tax, national insurance and um, dividend tax. How limiting do you think it is? Or, you know, do you think it's possible for the Scottish Parliament to be very radical on income tax when they don't have control over the other types of taxation as well? Sorry, jump in. <laughs> Do jump in. Um, I think there are some significant constraints currently on, on the Scottish government, government, exactly as you say. There is no um, <clears throat> power up here currently in, in relation to capital gains tax, corporation tax, inheritance tax, national insurance contributions, particularly on the decision around incorporation um, point. All of those taxes play a part in that, and therefore to have no power and control over that makes it very difficult um, in taking decisions on the on the income tax side of things. I think all governments are subject to those constraints. Um, the UK government's equally subject to those constraints in relation to EU law and, and things like VAT, um, which may well change going forwards, clearly. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there, there's certainly limitation on, on the ability to make significant changes. I suppose with the rates, it, it's a fairly blunt instrument, isn't it? All you can do is increase or decrease the amount of tax. Um, you can't take countermeasures. So, for example, with, with the issue of incorporation, you know, income tax is, is, is one of the factors, but there's also NICs and corporation tax rates, which are, well, and, and CGT, IHT as well. Um, the, the, these are factors which you don't control. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a it, it is a, a limited tool, yeah. And you take the risk. That's, I think the point is that you, you bear the risk, and there's there's very little other, very few other levers that you have that you can you can mitigate the risk. Thank you, William. You wanted to have some some questions in that area, and then we'll come to Patrick and advantages and disadvantages. Yes, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning. <clears throat> Uh, at the outset, the question for Susanna Simpson, please, arising from something that Ivan McKee said. I have a concern that the debate becomes laden with value judgments about incorporation that, and that avoidance, incorporation is avoidance of tax and tax avoidance somehow cheats the public purse and is immoral. Uh, your paper is quite clear that actually the ultimate choice of commercial structure is primarily made in the light of commercial and family considerations with tax as a secondary consideration. Now, my experience says that that's right, uh, and I suspect your experience says that's right, but what I'm concerned with, is there objective data that says that that's right? Uh, or is this simply a, an experience from PwC? I, I must admit it's, an ex it's my experience. We don't have and haven't carried out any research in this area, so I can't give you any empirical data. It may well exist out there, but not that I'm aware of. Are you aware of whether anyone else is carrying out that analysis? Because the, uh, some of the evidence that we've seen previously would contradict that assessment and, and suggest that everyone's incorporating to avoid tax. Uh, you obviously take a different view. Uh, I would agree with that different view, but that is an experiential thing. Uh, is there any evidence out there? Is anyone going to take any evidence on that to prove the point? Well, Sandra, I mean, the, yeah. the spikes in the OBR figures, um, sorry, the, the, the figures are from companies' houses. It's extraordinarily, di extraordinarily difficult to get historic figures from companies' houses, actually. But the the OBR figures show these spikes, which which must be related to two tax matters, the, the, the spikes in 2002, 2004, and then again in 2006. Dramatic increase in the number of incorporations that were related to the, you know, the, the zero rate of tax on the micro companies and a change, change, predicted change to the managed service companies and they were trying to incorporate before that change came in in the hope that they would be excluded from the change. So it, my, my point is, I think, is, is that there is, where there is significant differences, 
there is a tax, um, a, a, a purely tax-driven behavioural response. And I think that the, 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 the spikes in corporations, which are specifically related to tax changes, can be, um, there is evidence of that. But in where the differentials are um, smaller, then I don't think that's true. Uh, moving on to just Sandra Eden, uh, a number of submissions have analysed how a reduction in tax or, or the impact of incorporation on a reduction in tax. So you, I think you said earlier there was uh, a loss of, say, six billion, uh, but an increase uh, or a recoupment of three billion through a different tax, give or take. Uh, are you aware, has there been any other analysis of other? spin-off impact. So just for example, if I incorporate, I will use a local law firm to do it, I'll use a local accountant, uh, I'll use local suppliers, I'll rent a premises. So there is, a, if you like, an indirect benefit to the local economy, none of which would have happened if I was an employee. Uh, but presumably, if we, <clears throat> my point being, if, if we take a very blunt analysis of tax take, uh, yeah. is there evidence of what else is going on? The knock-on advantages. I, Correct. I, I am not aware of any. No, sorry. Right. Uh, do you think someone ought to be doing that exercise uh, so that the other side of the coin almost is... Uh, it, 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 we are aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think it's hard. It, it, would be, it would be a very difficult piece of research to do. Um, to, 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 to get good figures that would be valid over uh, a period of years, I suspect. Mm -hmm. But should they? I don't know whether this is a piece of information that, that you, you know, obviously one would like to have loads more information about this. You need to have a much greater degree of certainty of the impact of, of uh, the things that you're talking about doing. I think that's absolutely right. In the perfect world, we would have all of that inf information available for us because it goes to that certainty point, so you know the impact of the changes that you're making. It's whether that information is available. I just think it, it probably ought to be available because if we've been asked to make a decision uh, based on tax take, uh, that does give one side of the, of the coin and doesn't say, look, there's, there's actually some positive impact, uh, potentially. I have one final question, again, on, on data and analysis. Is there any analysis that you're aware of uh, on how many economically inactive people become economically active through the incorporation model who wouldn't otherwise through being employed? I'm not aware of any data on that. Um, we have done some research, um, and I haven't got the um, numbers in front of but we've done some research on the impact of the gig economy, um, which is something that's driving that. So where you have, for instance, um, people coming back into work and working from home and choosing more likely to be self-employed um, to start off with part-time workers. Um, that is, you know, that's changing and there's a lot more of that um, than there was in the past. So they are more likely to be self-employed than, than moving into employment, but I don't have the, the, the data um, to prove that. Uh, from what you can recall, it, it, does that, that, that sounds like anecdotal evidence, but does that tend to suggest that people are making a rational choice uh, to choose that model, to re-enter the, the market, or are they doing it uh, based on your data for, because they're forced to or they have no other choice? I think it's probably a combination of the two because being self-employed when you are moving back into the market um, is likely to be a more flexible um, manner of, of um, operating than immediately going back into employment um, and being required to work full time or um, almost full time. So I think it just uh, for a while, and that's, this is my experience from speaking to clients rather than based on anything empirical, but it is that sort of step into back into the um, workplace is more likely to happen through self-employment rather than employment. Thank you. Okay. Patrick. Thanks very much. It, uh, it does seem to me, not just from the, the, the last few minutes of the discussion, but also from some of the evidence we heard last week, that the, there's a, a case for uh, more research on a range of the aspects of, of this issue. Uh, particularly, there's kind of 
slightly grey area between what's being called the, the gig economy uh, and uh, what's often described as bogus self-employment, uh, where you've actually got someone in an employment relationship, uh, but they, they are only given the option of, of, of having that through uh, some form of self-employment and losing all of the, uh, the consequent rights and protections that would come with, with employment, uh, which I think many people would say give real flexibility. Um, I was looking at the list of advantages and disadvantages of incorporation uh, in Susanna Simpson's uh, written submission. And um, it occurs to me that this is, uh, this is where we should be focused if we want to actually uh, engage in, in some kind of um, meaningful attempt to make a difference in what's happening. Now, it may be that the, the government of, of any day doesn't wish to deliberately try and intervene in that way. But if there was an assumption uh, that we have uh, government policy which recognises there is, to some extent, a tax avoidance element in incorporation, uh, or that that's one part of, of uh, the motivation in some circumstances, is there anything that, first of all, the Scottish government in a devolved context can do, or secondly, that the UK government uh, in, a, uh, in a reserve context ought to be doing to alter the balance between the advantages and disadvantages uh, in order to achieve its desired effect of supporting incorporation where there is genuine uh, uh, benefit to society and the economy, uh, but uh, disincentivising it where it's um, closer to that grey area around bogus self-employment. Can we intervene in the balance of those advantages and disadvantages to that effect? That, I seen that's a question to me initially. Yeah, <laughs> um, to jump in, I think um, that that's I agree that's a very good place to start to focus that those advantages and disadvantages. And you'll note on the disadvantages list, um, PAYE. So the the sort of tax factor in that is only one of the of the number of, of disadvantages in there. Uh, I think it comes back to the number of levers available to the Scottish government uh, as devolution is stands currently, um, given that there is only the lever over income um, tax rates. Um, currently, and everything um, around capital gains tax, corporation tax, dividend um, tax rates is currently out, out, out with um, control. So there is a limit to the amount um, that the Scottish Government at the moment can impact this. A lot of these are around um, legal limitations, and obviously, um, from a corporate perspective, Scots law and, um, and, and the laws, legal system south of the border are, are very similar around um, incorporation. So there is probably more that could be done to change those sort of underly underlying legal. Um, factors, but that is a sort of a, a much bigger um, uh, decision or, or question to take on. I think one option, for example, might be for the Scottish government to uh, have um, either some restriction or some some uh, code which sets out in what circumstances people can access uh, devolved uh, taxpayer-funded business support services, grant and loan schemes, uh, public procurement uh, opportunities. Uh, or, in fact, the ability uh, or the, the, the willingness of public bodies and agencies to employ people in certain structures uh, or, or you know, other structures that they would uh, generally avoid. To what extent would that be a useful tool uh, in giving a clear signal to the rest of the economy, you know, here's what's on and here's what's not on? I think, going back to clarity, if that is set out as a clear objective, um, within legislation or, or, or guidance, then you know the taxpayers at least are aware of, of, of the intention behind the, um, the legislation. But I can't give you a view on whether that's the correct policy or, or not. That's outside my remit. Not necessarily a correct policy. I wouldn't expect you to comment on that, but uh, a, a policy with the potential to have an effect. Again, I think if there's a transparency of objective around something that's being done, then it always increases clarity for, for, the, for the public. The other witnesses want to comment on these issues? I will in a minute, yeah. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll put it in the context of my other remarks. <laughs> um, I, I think one of, one of the main guilty parties here is actually national insurance, which obviously is um, outside your remit. And the, it, it is no longer the case that the huge difference between employer and employee NICs um, is justified by the differential in benefit entitlement. You know, th th there used to be some sort of um, some sort of link at, at one level. 
And I think national insurance contributions actually have to be looked at across the board, all scrapped. All. Yeah. This, this is, is something that rumbles on. The problem is, of course, that politically it seems to be a bit easier. Well, actually, no. The recent evidence suggests, suggests otherwise, of course, that it is a bit, a bit easier to get money through national insurance contributions than tax. But um, the last few months suggest that that's, that's no longer the case. Um, do, 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 as, do as we do, I suppose, in, in terms of encouraging people who are, have that employment relationship to have an employment contract. Um. The recent events around national insurance, uh, for, for me, sort of slightly underline an argument that was put at a, at a previous session in this inquiry, uh, which is that company law, as it stands at the moment, isn't... Uh, up to meeting the, the, the requirements of the modern economy and that what's required is a, a, a more fundamental rewrite, uh, perhaps you know, more, more kind of points along the spectrum between employment and, and incorporation or uh, closing the, the, the gap in, in tax paid by people in different structures. Is a fundamental rewrite in, in company law required? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I'm not a commercial lawyer. <laughs> okay. uh, I was going to come on to the human rights issues. Do you want others to come in first? or? Uh, we've finished all the incorporation stuff. And, and, and we're going to, we're going to, I want to make sure that Judith gets a chance to reflect on her paper. Has anybody got any other corporation questions at this stage? Well, we haven't. And I know, Susanna, you, you've got to be away for, I think, half past ten. So if, if, you, if we're still in evidence session and you're still here and you need to go, please Fantastic. just feel free to make your uh, exit at that time. Um, can we just start somebody else off in the human, sure, human I'll rights thing, in. just so we yep. can let you back in, Pat. Willie, you want to kick us off? Oh, thanks very much, Convener. Good morning, Pamela. And I was hoping to table. bring Judith into uh, focus in the discussion in terms of human rights. Um, your paper, at the outset, Judith said, taxation is a crucial contributing component of the realisation of human rights. And while that might not be so immediately obvious to many, People out there, your paper makes clear that it's, it's fundamentally at the heart of fairness in society. You, you also talk about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and Impacts on Women. My question to you is, how do we assess these impacts more directly to, to illustrate the impacts that taxation changes may actually have? It, data tends to be in the hands of governments and agencies and so on, but in terms of your own uh, agency, how do you reach out and analyse and present to MSPs or to the wider public about the wider impacts that changes in taxation policy can have with respect to human rights. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to, to talk on this issue. Um, I think, in, in direct answer to your question, there are a number of tools that are available and, and at your disposal in order to do a human rights impact assessment of policy. It is actually currently a requirement of equalities legislation that an equalities impact assessment is done in advance of a decision being made on policy. And the kinds of impacts that you've just been talking about in relation to incorporation, for example, um, give an indicate give give some um, lines into assessing both in terms of revenue, the return um, on the decision, on the impact of a decision, and the drivers of change within a decision, within a process. Um, those are some of the potential human rights assessments that, that we can make. Um, and, and the reason we're, we're talking about coming at this from a human rights perspective is that, is that it provides both a framework that people can begin to understand. So again, in the, in the principles of certainty that people were talking about, transparency, um, having a conversation with the public, um, an understanding from a public perspective of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I think the human rights framework gives us a framework in which to do that. Um, and clearly, it's underpinned by international law. So it's not just something that's good to have, it's something that is actually been something that, as a UK, as a state party, the UK has signed up to, the Scottish Parliament and public authorities in Scotland are committed to through the Scotland Act. So there is, there is a, a kind of legal framework that, 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 that provides the, the basis and the underpinning um, of taking a human rights perspective indeed to any policy. But in this instance, you, you were asking about the Scottish approach to taxation 
Commission um, from a principled perspective, as, as I say, enshrined in law, um, it gives it gives the Scottish Parliament a really strong basis on which to be looking and assessing decisions that they make in relation to taxation. And, that's, that, and those decisions coming from a range of international treaties um, provide, provide a framework for having that conversation with the public. Mm -hmm. See, when you look across the, the landscape in different jurisdictions, to, can, can you see any evidence uh, or data from other jurisdictions that, that show that their particular government, for example, has introduced a measure which has had a certain impact in society. Is that clear to us? Could we pick that kind of information up in order to help guide us in our decision making in the, in the years to come? Um, there are examples from across the world, in fact. Um, the South African Constitution has, um, has brought economic, social, cultural rights at heart and centre to its constitutional framework um, the, 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 within that setting um, government public authorities decision makers have to take into account their impact on economic social cultural rights as well as civil political rights into their into their um, uh, thinking when they're making decisions back home in Scotland um, the Minister, Jean Freeman, has committed to bring the right to Social Security into the heart of policy making in, in Scotland today. That will have an impact on the way that policy is, is delivered um, in terms of communicating to people what their rights are in relation to Social Security in Scotland, um, the way the system is designed, the processes that have been gone through to design that system and to actually um, establish that as, as a it is already people's right. They already have a right to social security, but enshrining it in law um, and domestic law strengthens it domestically. And what about infringements? Should they occur or alleged infringements of people's human rights in relation to things like taxation or, or fiscal policy or whatever? Where do people go for redress? Is, do we disappear down the legal route to the European Court? Or? human rights and so on, do we, do we go in there and is it very difficult to achieve any kind of redress if people feel or there are judgments in fact made about human rights issues in relation to these matters? We can keep it general or make it more specific to taxation explicitly um, at a level at, at that's up to you but one of the fundamental principles of a rights-based approach is, is bringing in effective accountability, effective redress, and ensuring that within a system that the Scottish Government and Parliament decides to establish, that the systems of redress are explicit, um, it's clear how they can be accessed, they are resourced and funded, there's effective monitoring, um, and that there's a, there's a, a really um, a, a transparent process by which people can access um, justice. Now, in the context of taxation, um, you would be making an assessment of uh, from the principles would, would say we're, we're coming from an issue of we're looking at the resource take, so we're looking at the resources that we're actually seeking to generate. Um, uh, we're looking at what we want to spend those resources on. So how how fair is 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 that expenditure process, and then how transparent, how accountable and transparent are we making the systems by which people can a understand what's happening? So at, people have talked here about certainty, about rationale, about transparency, can understand what it is that they're being asked to contribute to, and crucially why. Um, and then there's a clear system whereby they can they can make appeal, um, uh, that system is affordable, accessible, and people are aware of it, they can access effectively their rights. So, so there's a, in, in, I'm not being very specific, as in here's a specific system. What I'm saying is there are principles that as a, in any aspect of government policy, you can work from. And a level, <laughs> given that you have established a national human rights institution as an, as a as a as a country, we're 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 we're, we're signed up to constitutionally to to um, uh, endorse the, our international treaties that the UK as a state has has signed up to. Um, we have a we have a an obligation to to bring these matters into our uh, the way we do business in in Scotland. And lastly, can you, where will we stand? Do you think with with all of this, if, if the UK does scrap the Human Rights Act, it's perhaps not so clear at the moment 
but that was their stated intention recently. In, in fact, the Prime Minister said we should withdraw for the European Convention on Human Rights, saying that it adds nothing to the prosperity of the country. I mean, why are we going to judge or measure any of this if we move away from that Human Rights Act altogether? Our human rights protections will be severely weakened if that happens, clearly. Um, there will be uh, very little backstop, very little basis on which those kind of principles and decisions which internationally we have signed up to. I, mean, I, I can't emphasise that enough. These are not, these are not commitments that we have um, come by lightly. They were negotiated internationally. We were part of those negotiations and in many contexts actually setting the terms of the debate. Um, and th that, was a, both a political, that was a political process internationally that, that the UK is committed to. So no, I mean, the, 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 con the protections that are provided by the, the Convention and by the Human Rights Act are strong, they're important, um, and in fact, from the, the perspective of the Human Rights Commission and indeed many other national human rights institutions, um, they should be strengthened not weakened. Um, we, ha we are not fully protected in relation to international human rights standards. We do not have in the UK those protections and any attempt to weaken them should be resisted and, and, and you know, stepped back from. And, and it, in any setting where that might happen, then public authorities in Scotland, including the Parliament and the Government, has a duty to ensure that it does everything within its power to put in place those protections that it can, and that would be a recommendation from the Human Rights Commission as well, Scottish Human Rights Commission as well. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I know there's a couple of supplementary. James, I think you were interested in transparency issues, and that's been mentioned a couple of times, so I'll bring you as a first supplementary and then Adam. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, convener. I, I was interested in the points you made and also the points in your submission about transparency and public participation. Um, obviously, the decisions made around taxation have a, a big impact. You know, they have an impact on families and individuals in terms of how much taxation they pay um, and therefore uh, impact on their, their household in income and also the impact on the level of budgets and therefore how much you know we're able to invest and spend on communities. But a lot of the discussion around this, a bit like we've, we've, we've had this morning, um, can be quite technical. Um, so uh, there's a, I think there's a big issue about people on the ground being able to interact with that. So what, what do you think can be done to make, in terms of more transparency, what can be done to make more information available in a, in a more understandable format so that people can participate with the, the, the decisions around taxation and how they will impact on their lives? Um, I think that's the answer we probably could all have a view on. Um, I think from a, from a human rights perspective, again, we have a duty to, to provide information in a way that is accessible to all um, people in our society. It doesn't discriminate and indeed supports people's access to that information. So doing that, um, both in terms of uh, participating in decision making, actually contributing to the thinking and the analysis and why decisions might be made. Um, we have a responsibility to do that. There's, there's many, many things we can do um, we, uh, in terms of engaging uh, all sorts of NGOs, community organisations in the conversation around, around the principles, both the principles of, of the, our, whether it be our tax system or indeed any other system of, of policy, revenue system, um, and both the, the the, the whys, the principles and the underpinning, and then um, what the money is going to be spent on. Because that's, that's, the, that's what enables um, citizens to sign up. Where uh, internationally, where um, government revenue is raised by a, a system of taxation, the, 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 the population's investment in the government processes is far more increased than if, for example, the, the finances is coming, is coming directly through natural resource revenue um, or some other means. And so that dynamic of a citizen's contract with the state and an investment in, in the state as, a, as an effective delivery vehicle, um, that for me is, it, not for me, but from a human rights perspective, is a, is a fundamental dynamic which and so that those processes of engagement, those processes of participation, um, are they're crucial. Um, uh, I mean, I can I can describe some specific. There are very good ways internationally and domestically, and in England, and on, indeed, to be honest, the Scottish through 
the community empowerment legislation, where actually budget has been allocated to a participatory budgeting process, where you've put, you know, you, you've made decisions that, uh, as, that that we are actually going to empower communities to participate in dis ways of of spending that budget. That, for me, is a very good example of of en enabling that participation. Now. How we monitor that participation, how we monitor the quality of that participation and the, and the effectiveness of it and the degree of participation, these are all resource is issues and implications that have to be dealt with within decision making. But there, there's myriad examples um, of, of good practice, in fact, and any NGO who's working with people who are vulnerable, whose you know, issues in relation to receiving information, understanding it, communicating it, will have plenty of really good practice to, to communicate. It, difficult concept, um, but they're not that difficult. People understand making a contribution and getting something back from that contribution. That's not a difficult, that's not fundamentally a difficult concept. We make it very, very complicated, actually. We really make it complicated. Um, now, yeah, yeah, apparently our tax book is Massive. Um, I, I, that one of the maybe one of the the principles, one of the lessons of 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 the principles of a human rights approach is actually simplifying the process so that people can fundamentally understand it, and indeed we can fundamentally understand and predict outcomes of decisions much more easily because the complexity is reduced. Yeah, I'm sure you want to contribute to this as well. Well, I mean, just just one thing in support that, uh, of something Judith said is, is there is evidence to show that the um, greater degree of sort of trust, using the word loosely, mm. in uh, in your government is uh, directly correlated with voluntary tax compliance. Um, so the, the the more the the people believe you're doing a good job and that you're spending the money properly, the more likely you are going to get people kind of paying tax without the arm up the back. Um, the other thing that uh, might be thought about, it, it, it's something that's it's very visible. The economists don't like it, but th these are hypothecated taxes where you raise a particular amount of money and you commit that to a particular budget. You know, the, um, the Lib Dems are, 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 have talked about that. Now, the economists say that this is, these are bad things because you're, um, you should be spending the money where you should best spend the money rather than actually committing yourself in advance to, to spend a particular portion of money in a particular way. But if you're talking about visibility and, and an easy way of people understanding where their tax is going, you could say an extra penny is going to go into, you know, cat and dog home or something. Um, as I say, they, they, they're not generally regarded by the economists as um, particularly good taxes, but economists don't know everything. I'd agree entirely um, with that, and particularly coming onto the hypothecated taxes, I think we've got a great opportunity in Scotland, starting from scratch, without a huge bulk of legislation behind us as we move forward. Um, to, we've already set out the Scottish Government principles around taxation. I think that's really helpful, and just being very simple, exactly as Judith has said, as around, around those principles drives um, behavioural movements from the people people impacted by it um, and I think also going into the hypothecated taxes I agree ring fencing the receipts that are coming out of those taxes things like the soft drinks levy we've kind of gone down that route um, and proposals in that regard makes it very very clear as to where the government and government policy is going and therefore has the in, in, intended effects in terms of behaviours. Adam, you have a supplementary from LRC. Yeah, thank you. Just, this is just arising out of the um, exchange a few moments ago between Judith Robertson and, 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 and Willie Coffey. And Judith, you answered um, Willie's uh, question about, um, uh, about enforcement in a way that you yourself described as rather generic. Um, and, and I just want to drill down into a bit more of the detail of that, because human rights law isn't generic about the enforcement of human rights, is it? It's quite specific and quite particular in the sense that effective judicial protection of human rights is itself a human right. That's been the case in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice for decades, and it's of course what we see in Article 13 of the European Convention. You'd agree with that, I assume? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, uh, um, uh, it, would it therefore be your position that any um, uh, putative uh, human rights approach to either taxation or to social security, which you mentioned um, earlier, uh, would have to include a right to effective judicial protection for it really to be a human rights approach? Ultimately, yes, absolutely. Um, however, 
Well, there's a number of things you can say. I would say, yes, a, a judicial approach gives the final backstop of protection. Um, it, uh, it's, it's the last, for many respects, the la where you, it's the last place you would want people to end up. Um, ultimately, one of the intentions of human rights approach is to influence and affect all policy, so that it isn't just about a judicial backstop, it's about a process which enables a consideration and a reflection and a review. And so policy, one of the things that the impact, for example, internationally is reckoned of incorpor full incorporation of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. So full incorporation basically meaning it's enshrined in domestic law, um, which currently is not the case in Scotland or the UK for this Convention of the Rights of the Child, um, is that it impacts all of policy. So it, is, it isn't just the, ju the judicial backstop that, that, it, that is fundamental, but it's the process up front which changes the way policy is made and changes what policies are put in place. And so, potentially, the threat of a judicial backstop is one of the things that drives that change. Now, that's, that's, that's a, a legitimate process. But I suppose one of the reasons that that fundamental peace was put in place was because of the reason that human rights law was put in place in the first place, was there was a recognition that states could abuse their power to the detriment, the vast detriment of their populations. And so putting in place a protection which gave a citizen the fundamental right to hold their state to account via a judicial process was a really important principle of human rights law. And so, so for me, seeing that, um, that ability, now it's you know that's that's the last recourse um, that, that we would be looking for. But having it in place is is powerful. It sends a powerful message to the citizen that actually we're going to be held responsible for our actions. Not, not merely is it powerful; it's essential if you are serious about having a human rights-based approach to either taxation or social security. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Susanna. I'm conscious of the time. Twenty-six minutes past. Do you, do you want to? Make That's it good the, timing. The, the, the stage <laughs> and that make it make, make it easier for you before we get into the next set of questions. Thank you. I'll go Ash, then I'll come to Patrick. Ash. Um, this is a question for Judith Robertson as well. So in the submission that you put in, um, it says that a state should take strong measures to combat tax abuse. And if they don't, then they're not fully realising, you know, economic, social and cultural rights and so on. And then a, a quote from that from the submission was that tax abuse is not a victimless crime. So if we're saying that the tax gap in the UK um, is estimated, the most recent one I could find was from 2014, and it was £120 billion a year. Um, obviously, most of the powers over enforcing that um, are held at the UK government level. But clearly, that does have an effect on Scottish government public finances. Therefore, do you see a link then between um, the, the UK government's failure to close that tax gap and Scottish human rights? Uh, now you come to mention it. <laughs> um, well, it's, uh, I suppose it's uh, any again coming back to the principle, uh, the pr one of the principles, the human rights principle of transparency and accountability. Um, so uh, that gap where revenue, where there's an expectation that the revenue would be generated and the revenue isn't generated, means that it's harder for any government, including the Scottish government, to put in place policies, health, social care, education, to support policies which um, actually deliver people's rights on the ground. Um, ultimately, that's, that's, that's where we want to get to. That's what the human rights framework is intended to do. And, and um, yeah, it, 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 it potentially removes resources. Now, that's a, that's a global phenomenon. I have to say, I'm not, it's not in defence of the UK government. Clearly, the UK government is, in fact, one of the um, the, the, one of the international drivers of, of some of those processes of, of enabling um, tax avoidance. Um, but, but domestically, it removes revenue from, potential revenue from public authorities to spend, absolutely, and therefore limits the capacity of those authorities to deliver people's rights. There is a direct cor correlation, absolutely. And in a Scottish context, if we're taking a, an approach to taxation here, ensuring that that tax is is paid, is is monitored, is adequately collected, and then and then being held to account for that expenditure is is an integral part of of the process. Yes. Yes, there's a bit of a dichotomy developing there then between if Scotland takes a different approach on tax. Um, more of a rights-based approach, for instance, and then the UK government 
you know, is, I mean, if we just use the tax gap as one example, is, is maybe taking a different approach on that. And, you know, we know about the secrecy jurisdictions in London and so on. So you've got two differing approaches. Is it possible for them to, to work and be compatible within one island? Yes, I, th I would say that's absolutely possible. It's not without its challenges, but you're going to have to make the... the, the, the as a parliament and government, you'll have to make a choice about how, what you're, you're having this conversation about. A, 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 is there a Scottish approach to taxation? Um, ultimately, there will be a Scottish approach, now, uh, um, no matter what that is, and and you will make the you will make a decision about about that that process. Um, from my perspective, the Scottish government and parliament can make a decision which is advancing people's rights, um, being progressive, making that as they call it under economic social culture rights, progressive realisation possible um, or, or has the potential to do something which goes the other direction. Now, clearly, um, th th that, that's, a, that's a, 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 a political decision, um, but uh, clearly we're advocating that we go in a progressive direction and, it, yeah, it's possible to be different. Thank you. You've done achieved that in many other areas of policy. I see no reason why you can't do it in taxation. Patrick, I'm coming to you now. I'm sorry I didn't bring it a bit earlier on this. Okay. I'm trying to make sure I was getting everybody else in the room involved in the conversation as well, because I know you'd signalled up an, an interest in this area. So. No, that's fine. The, um, the, the enforcement angle uh, I'd like to, to pick up on, first of all. Um, just help me to understand the extent to which uh, citizens can take action against government on human rights grounds in relation to, to fiscal decisions at the moment because they've clearly had some uh, success in doing that on welfare issues. For example, um, when uh, people were effectively required to work without pay uh, under threat of sanctions, uh, a series of successful court cases were taken against the UK government on that. If that level of, of human rights argument can be brought to a court in relation to welfare, is it not possible today to bring that level of human rights argument to a court uh, in relation to a government decision about taxation? To be honest, I'm not, I can't fully answer your question, Patrick, to be honest. I mean, it's a good question, and I, I can go away and do a bit of research and come maybe back to you with a, with a specific answer. That would be principle, I, I actually agree with you. I don't think there is any reason why somebody couldn't. It might be quite an indirect route. Um, it might be quite hard to argue. Um, uh, it might be easier in the, an instance of a hypothecated tax where you're making a direct correlation between what the money is being what the money raised is being gener is being spent on. So you're so you're looking for a human rights impact. There may be instances where there may be instances where um, actually where uh, in relation to the right to property, the right to ownership, where, where some of those arguments about about property rights have been used to, uh, to, to I don't know if they've actually been used to challenge a taxation decision. Um, so there may be instances, both domestically or internationally, where that has been done. I'm, I'm not aware of the direct ones. I'm not aware of, of attempts within the UK to do that either, which is why I was, I was asking whether it's possible. Uh, I think Sandra... Well, I mean, the, 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 there have been... There have been cases on, well, on, but both on property and, and on the, the right to human life. In fact, one of the UK cases went to the Grand Chamber. It was two sisters who were trying to claim an inheritance tax um, relief when one of the elderly sisters um, died because they couldn't marry, so they couldn't. Um, the, the, the answer is, is that it, it has been a, a relatively weak tool, um, challenges to, 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 to the court because um, of the large margin of appreciation that the court has given to um, national jurisdictions to impose tax. So mm. um, in, in very long delays or retrospective taxation, quite, quite unusual types of things have been successful, but on the whole, you, you can design your own tax system. And in, in trying to move to a stronger situation in, in respect of the, the ability of citizens to exercise these rights and, and, and challenge government decisions, on tax is part of the complexity the fact that we have tax decisions taken by the UK government, the Scottish government and local government. So for example a person uh, who argued that their cumulative tax burden uh, including uh, th uh, things like council tax which is set at a local level that their cumulative tax burden 
was higher than somebody uh, who was much wealthier, and that, that that tax burden overall was what was uh, depriving them of the ability to exercise their human rights or to access their human rights. To whom would they bring that challenge? Uh, at the moment, uh, well, I mean, they could take, uh, 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 the cumulative tax burden would be within, uh, uh, well, at the moment, you might want to do that under equalities legislation, um, uh, whether or not they, uh, the, the, actually they were being discriminated against because of the cumulative impact of 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 a, of, a, of a piece of policy, whether that be taxation or welfare reform, whatever. And that's something that's been advocated for by the Equality and Human Rights Commission in relation to really understanding the impact of policy is to do that cumulative impact assessment. Um, at the moment, um, because under the Human Rights Act, for example, it's principally civil and political rights that are being that are protected explicitly. Um, uh, there, there is there is limited protection. Um, it's quite uh, uh, um, uh, uh, around economic, social, cultural rights. So, so we are advocating that the Scottish government, Parliament, and indeed the UK government um, incorporates those rights in order that th those questions can more adequately be be explored. Scottish ministers uh, are unable to take actions that that breach people's human rights. Uh, it's not just that this parliament can't pass legislation that does so, ministers can't act uh, except in compliance with, with human rights. Uh, that's not true, as far as I understand it, of UK ministers' actions. Uh, I don't know whether it's true of local yes. councils in, in making their tax decisions. It is, yeah. It's true mm. of UK ministers too. UK, you, you, sorry. No, neither UK ministers nor local authorities in England, Wales or any other part of the United Kingdom are lawfully able to breach people's human rights under Section 6 of the Human Rights Act. Thank you. I, I'm, <laughs> great, I'm grateful to the witness. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of where, where the challenge would be directed uh, if, the, if the, the, the tax decisions which are affecting a person's human rights oh. are the result of more than one level of government? Uh, I'm, 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 I, I'm, so, I'm not a lawyer. For, mm. Forgive me, I can, we can get this with the lawyers, but I'm not, I don't actually think the route is... If we're, if we're going through a court process, um, the, 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 the decision-maker is, is, the, is the one that is impacted, wherever the decision is made. Um, I, 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 yeah, I think that would have to be through the Scottish National Court process. Um, I just wanted to ask as well about the, the, the basic principles um, and to see if I understand the, the, the general thrust of, of your paper. The principles uh, which the Scottish Government proposes for taxation policy are uh, largely about the, the direct fiscal impacts proportionate to the ability to pay certainty to the taxpayer, convenience, ease of payment and efficiency. Those, those are about the individual taxpayer and, and how they're directly affected by by tax policy. It seems to me that you are arguing three things about these basic principles. And, and uh, you know, I'd be grateful for your view on whether I understand this right. It seems to me you're firstly arguing that there should be a principle of sufficiency, that tax policy must be sufficient to raise revenue that meets public need uh, in, in respect of, of providing people's uh, human rights and, and, and ensuring that those are not breached. Secondly, that indirect effects of tax policy uh, on people's human rights should be included uh, as, a, as a principle, that the, the effects of tax policy need to, to be compliant, not just the operation of it. Uh, and thirdly, that there should be a prin principle of accountability. Is that broadly correct? Are you asking that the Scottish Government should specify those in its principles of tax policy? Um, broadly, that is correct. Um, the Article 2 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights um, uh, effectively demands that each state party undertake steps individually um, and through international assistance and cooperation, especially economic and technical, to the maximum of its available resources. So that's to the ma that's 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 to seek to maximise those e available resources as well. So, so in order to achieve people's economic, social, cultural rights, that's just within one 
Covenant One Treaty. There are many treaties where reference to the, that 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 process of actually raising the revenue to do the work that the treaty demands um, are, are are highlighted and and brought brought made made public that we are we have signed up to. So yes, we have an absolute commitment and duty to deliver against those recommendations. Um, uh, to, to progressively achieve the full realisations of rights um, recognised in the Covenant. And so, so that, for me, is the fundamental underlining principle of any tax system, that we're seeking to actually um, to achieve that. So making those uh, transparent and accountable connections between the revenue being raised what the money is being spent on, what we're seeking to achieve by that money. Taxes, taxation is a means to an end. It isn't an end in itself. And, and um, enabling people to better understand the end it achieves more that investment in, in contributing to it. We have, in my view, this is not, um, we have a pretty toxic relationship with taxation in, in the public narrative in the UK. In other countries around the world, the relationship to taxation is is, is valued very differently. Um, it's valued as it's seen as something that people are proud of contributing um, to. It's seen as something that people value. They 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 are they're very open about it. I, I believe in some of the Scandinavian countries, people entire tax um, contribution is published is made public. We're very we're, we we have a very uh, closed attitude and relationship to this issue. We have the opportunity to to change that, I think, in Scotland. And one of the ways to do that is to be is to be transparent and accountable and explicit as to as to our intention. The, the, the principles that you've outlined are are good, but in my view not sufficient in order to achieve what I've just described. And I think we have an, an opportunity to achieve that. And bringing a rights-based approach to doing that, it, it doesn't <laughs> we have a duty to do that. That's the one that's a key issue, clearly, but it also provides a legitimate framework within which we can start to communicate to citizens about these issues much more clearly. And if we took all of government policy within that framework, or all of it which is relevant within that framework, which is frankly most of it, um, then all of that conversation would start to resonate and have a, a different kind of meaning for people. And they could uh, that relationship between taxation and expenditure and would, would, would be a different kind of conversation. Some of this relates to Sandra Eden's earlier comments that, the, that there is research demonstrating a link between the level of trust in government uh, and voluntary tax compliance. Uh, I, I would find it valuable to get a, a reference to that, that research well, if it's, if there, it's available. There appears to be a correlation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not saying that, that, that it's necessarily a causative correlation, but there is a correlation. It would be really interesting to see yeah, uh, what, it's, the, it's, the reference to that was, research. It was old EU stuff. I, I can dig that out. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Pre the I'll, enlargement. I've got a couple of quick supplementary things. Murdo? Yes, uh, thank you. It, it was a, a follow-up to, to Patrick's first line of questioning around um, taxation and human rights. And I'm wondering, um, is there ever any level of taxation that would be deemed to be a breach of human rights? So, for example, if the government set a confiscatory rate of tax, say 98% or even 100%, do you think that could, could be challenged under human rights as, a, for example, a breach of the right to property? Uh, I think it probably could be challenged. Whether or not it would survive the challenge, depending on the uh, the rationale for doing that, um, uh, and the, the so based on the rationale for doing that, um, uh, it might that might be something to do with how that money was generated, um, uh, what, uh, and, and so there could be there could be extenuating circumstances. I suppose what what human rights um, law gives you is the opportunity to have that conversation, to have that debate and to see, is that proportionate? Is it, is it um, contribute, contributing to the progressive realisation? Um, is it justifiable um, from a rights perspective? Now, uh, I, clearly, I'm, under this conversation, I can't make that assessment. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it gives you that space to, to really look at the balance of rights um, and the reasons, the rationale for those decisions being made and to have that conversation up front um, so before you make that decision, um, is that a, is that a, a, a good? Um, a, 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 is it justifiable in human rights terms to to take that action in this setting for that reason? Okay, thank you, uh, Marie. Just a very 
quick supplementary note, slightly off topic, but I was very interested when you were discussing the possibility of whether a, a government, the UK government, could act against individuals' human rights. And I was immediately thinking of the welfare reform, the bedroom tax, where the UN declared that that was a systematic violation of the rights of disabled people. And I know it was challenged in the High Court, and is it being appealed in the Supreme Court? Or has that process worked right the way through yet? Or because many people do consider that to have been a breach of the rights of disabled people, and yet it, it, it is still currently policy, isn't it? It is still currently policy. And uh, at the moment, uh, no changes to policy, that policy have been made on the basis of either the intervention from the UN um, or, as I'm far away, from the court. So, so, um, so uh, yeah. Act against people's human oh, rights. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. T technically, it's not a tax. Really. No, it's no, not no, a tax. I know. No, clearly it's so not I know a tax, it's no. called. So I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's why I said it's slightly off topic. I know it's called the bedroom tax, but it was actually welfare reform. Yeah. Leo. Thank you. Leo. Uh, quickly, link back to incorporation, if I may. Uh, <clears throat> you've talked at some length about the transparency in how we spend uh, tax, and, and that people should understand that. Uh, can we extrapolate from that? Ought there not to be similar tar transparency in how we raise? tax from people and from that to ensure that everyone can make an, an informed and unfettered choice about how what vehicle is most appropriate for their circumstances, whether it be employment, self-employment or incorporation. Absolutely. I have to be honest. I mean, I would absolutely say that uh, that transparency in all those processes, I mean, I, I'm clearly not a tax expert, but listening to that conversation, one of the things that really struck me was the lack of certainty. And that in, an, in, in a, a, a context where there's lots of grey areas, then that does not enhance transparency or accountability. Um, it makes it really difficult to, 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 to either challenge either an individual for their decision um, or an organisation for their decision because there's lots of uncertainty. And so, so um, yeah, I would say that that transparency, it's, it really doesn't matter where you are in the system. Um, being able to make it very clear, explicit and transparent is, is a key principle. Well, I mean, I, I think the sort of prior thing is, is that you should be actually looking at how you tax these people and be taxing them in similar ways. Similar people should be taxed similarly, you know, horizontal equity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Sorry, that's another, that is another, that whole principle of, 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 of equality and non-discrimination in a process would also apply to the, 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 the structure of the taxation system. Now, the recommendation from many international UN experts are that progressive taxation systems are more likely to lead to human rights outcomes um, and this because you're taking less from those who have less. In fact, they're not more likely to. They will lead to um, uh, better human rights outcomes um, because those who can afford to contribute more are contributing more and those who are can afford to contribute less, actually do contribute less. So the cumulative impact that Patrick described or was uh, uh, you know, referring to of, of a tax burden, um, whether that be through indirect taxes such as VAT or, or, or direct taxation, um, uh, is a really important outcome. It's a really important indicator of, 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 of actually having a direct human rights impact. I mean, the UK tax system overall is, is mildly um, regressive when you take into account um, consumption taxes. If you look, look at the 20, top 20% yeah. and the bottom 20%, it's mildly regressive in total. I think we've probably now got to the natural end of that particular evidence session we've had this morning with witnesses. Can I thank very much the witnesses for coming along this morning and contributing to our deliberations. Um, at the start of the meeting, we agreed to take the next item in private. I therefore now close this public part of the meeting. Thank you very much.